I want to look with you at a passage now, which amazingly, and I, I, I think this may be a shock to you, that Billy Graham used to train the leaders in 1954 when he came to do Haringey. So Haringey was um, this amazing mission that took place that had a dramatic effect on evangelicalism in Britain. 40,000 people were converted in the, in the time there. And it just was remarkable. But of all the passages Billy could go to the night before the mission, he went to this one. And the question is, why did he do that? Well, could I ask you now just to read through um, uh, Joshua 7, and then we'll have a look at it together, and then we'll go from there. But if you could read through A Can Sin, um, perhaps with a just go through, and, and, and could I ask you this as you go through, could you please just look for what you think is the key thought in the passage? So that's what I'm going to ask you at the end of it. What's been the What's the key thing? What, what If there was one melodic line or one thing, one verse that sums it up, what would it be? Over to you, Joshua 7, um, Billy Graham's passage, uh, 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 and we go from there. Thanks. Um, yeah. that, is, that, is, that is the terrifying phrase in the passage. Let's have a look at it together, because again, as you listen now, could you listen, as I said yesterday in the plenary, if you listen to it, not so much as a reservoir where it just flows into you, but as a river. So it's going to go into you, but who could you teach this to? So as we go through, we're thinking, how could I do this as a study? And we'll just head through it together now and just, 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 just have a little, just try and bring it to light and then we'll apply it. But let's spend 10, 15 minutes looking at it together now. So uh, chapter chapter uh, uh, seven, verse verse one, as we as we start off. Um, uh, 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 um, but the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took some of them so that so the Lord's anger burned against him. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho, here we are, to Ai, which is Beth Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. AI. So, so compared to Jericho, Ai is a minor objective. In rugby terms, I hope you follow rugby, everyone. It's an Italy as opposed to the All Blacks, as opposed to New Zealand. You know, I mean, you should be able to knock them over. Not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's true. Basically, they can be very heavy tacklers, but that's where we are. But that's the point being made in verses 2 and 3, isn't it? Um, now, Joshua sent men from Jericho to, to Ai, near beth Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, spy out the land. The men go up. It's about 13 miles away. They come back and they say, oh, Ai is a piece of cake. Do you have that expression in your country? It's a piece of cake. It means it's easy. As you can see, I've eaten a lot of cake myself, but it's easy. We can just take it. Um, not all the army, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. You know, don't we send two or three thousand. Don't weary the whole army. So you can imagine Joshua breathing a sigh of relief. He thinks, well, well, I'll send some junior lieutenant to do it. You know, this is going to be easy. And after all, Jericho fell without a single casualty. So AI is going to be easy. We don't even have to pray. Verse four. Can we underline verse four? It's the first calamitous moment. So about three thousand went up. But they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gates as far as the stone quarries. So there we are. That's happened. And at this, do you see what's happened? Um, verse 5, it's very interesting what happens there. So 3,000 of them went up, verse 4. They were routed by the men of Ai, who killed 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gates as far as the stone quarries. At this verse five, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Now, until then, the hearts of the opposition had been melting in fear. So Rahab, the prostitute, said, when we heard how the Lord dried up the Red Sea and, and what you did to Zion and Og, whom you completely destroyed, this is what she says in chapter two, verse nine, our hearts melted. The Amorite kings hear how the Lord dried up the Jordan, their hearts melted, but now the boots on the other foot. 30, they, 
you know, 2,000 go up, 36 are killed, the Israelites' hearts melt, and now can you see, please, I wonder if we can, we can uh, uh, see them, three questions that all head in the same direction. Have a look for yourself in verses 6, 7, and 8. Can you see the questions? Uh, verses 7, 8, and 9, I mean. 7, 8, and 9, there are three questions, and they are all heading in the same direction. Verse 7. Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever uh, uh, bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Verse 8. But what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? Verse 9. What then will you do for your own great name? So these are all about snatching defeat from the joys of, jaws of victory. They're all about saying, saying, Lord, what has happened? But then, now this is amazing for evangelism. Please hold on to your seats. Can you, can you see the shock of, of 7 verse 10? Because can you see what is said in 7 verse 10? It's, it, it very seldom happens in the Bible. What are they told to do in 7 verse 10? Stand up. What are you doing on your face? Can we have that first slide, please? First slide, if we can get that up. Here's the, here's the, um, here's the issue. Here it is. That's the, the and the, now the second slide. Next one on, if we could. Next one down. Thanks. Brilliant. Here it is. What's the shock? They're told to stop praying. He said, stop praying. Um, instead, you're to judge the situation by the word of God. Verse 11, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen. They've lied. They've put them with their own possessions. So, so that is why the Israelites can't stand. And then the key, the key verse we'd already looked at, I won't be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. So um, there, was a, there was a pastor in the, um, in the southern states, and uh, at his prayer meeting, there was an old guy, and every week this old man would pray, oh, Lord, the old spider of sin, the spider of sin has been weaving his web, weaving his web. Lord, break the web, break the web, until one week the pastor, totally exasperated, shouted out, no, Lord, kill the he said, no, Lord, kill the spider. You know, that, that, that's the issue. You, you've got to put this sin to death. Now, this is huge for us over in England because we have an archbishop and other leaders who keep calling us to prayer, but they're not calling us to repentance. So with COVID, they asked for a day of prayer and action. But what they should have done is said, repentance. And, and that's what's not, what, 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 what's not happening here. And so uh, um, uh, 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 on we go in the passage. If we can come back to me, please. Let's keep going with the passage. Now we see what, what's going to happen. And, and of course, what we learn is that there are moments in the chaos of battle when everything stops dead. And I wonder if you can imagine Joshua, uh, uh, the, the, in the book of Joshua, Achan, he he, he, as he's routing um, Jericho, he runs into a street with a group of people. They go into a house and they clear it. They clear the house. Everyone leaves and he's left in a front room. And having been left in the front room, amidst the peace of that front room, we get verse 21. Can you see verse 21? When I saw the plunder of a beautiful robe from Babylon, a hundred, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing, weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them. I, I took them. They're hidden uh, in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So in the solitude of that front room, he runs in and he sees what in English terms would be about a half a million pounds worth of plunder. And he sees it. And he thinks, well, well, no one will notice. No one's going to see. What a waste. They're only going to go to waste. And then we learn in that verse, he looked, he longed, he took, he lied. And brothers and sisters, the issue here is idolatry. 
Acam had never asked himself, what can't I live without? What will I risk everything for? What gives meaning to my life? What do I trust in? Again, in, in, our, in English evangelicalism, with our understanding of sin, we're so often so bad at idolatry. We can't see the idols. And so blind to his own idols, he goes back and then laden down with plunder. I wonder if you can imagine him going back into Jericho in darkness, getting this plunder, coming back, waking up the kids in the tent, burying the silver, throwing his arms around his wife and saying, we're rich, we're rich, we're rich. We've done it. And, and for the next two days, he's just thrilled. But then the family next door, well, one of them, their men, the dad, goes off and he goes to clear AI. He doesn't even say goodnight, goodbye to his kids. And he says, I'll be home at lunchtime. And they bring back his body. And then Achan and his family hear the chilling diagnosis. Can we see verse 13? Can we look down verse 13 for the diagnosis? Here's the diagnosis. Go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. So one man is going to be picked out by tribe, clan, family, individual. One man... Now, he says, I'll do it tomorrow because he's giving Achan time to repent. But this is totally supernatural. God is going to put his, his finger on the culprit. And then verse 15. Do you see verse 15 as we look down? Whoever is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belongs to him. He's violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Now, what's Achan going to do? Does he understand? Do please jot this verse down. Does he understand? Be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers 32, verse 23. That's a verse I use so often. Be sure it's a promise. Your sin will find you out. Does he get that? Does he believe Psalm 139, verse 3? You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all your, my ways. Or does he think, no, there's something that God isn't familiar with, something he doesn't know. So now he's in the valley of decision. What's he going to do? And please remember what kindness and power and blessing he's, he's already seen from God. So he was there when they were fed in the wilderness with quail uh, uh, in, uh, at night and in the morning with, with manna. He was there. He saw water come out the rock. He saw the Jordan River stand up on either side. He saw the walls of Jericho fall down. He knows God provides for his people, but will he trust him? Is he going to obey? What's going to happen? There are very few who are as privileged as Achan was to see what he saw. And, 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 and you know, that's the issue. Um, I'm an evangelist. I'm very nosy. And I've got a friend called Graham and he's equally nosy and he was speaking at a school in the Midlands in England. And as he went to speak, there was a boy standing in the corridor <clears throat> who looked very nervous. And Graham said to him just before he was going to take assembly, he said to this boy, he said, any problems? And the boy said, yeah, yesterday at the end of school, when everyone was pouring out of school, somebody took a fire extinguisher off the wall and squirted it everywhere and graham said to the boy well did you do it and the boy replied i don't know in other words what he didn't know was not whether he'd done it or not when apparently he would soaked a third of the school sprayed everyone what he didn't know was whether he was going to confess to the headmaster or whether he was going to try and bluff God. Do you have that word bluff in your language? Bluff it. Bluff it means that you, you're just not going to go with the truth. You're going to pretend. And so this boy is going to bluff God. And Achan decides he's going to try and bluff God. So we get to the casting of lots early in the morning. And verse 17, the lots come out. Judah. And everyone falls back except Judah. And Achan, who's told his wife, will be fine, will be fine. Suddenly goes, oh, the Zerophites. And then the horror on his wife's face, Zimri, 
and then his heart bursts. Achan, be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure. Be sure it will find you out. And of course, this isn't, he then doesn't voluntarily come and confess his sin, like the prodigal in the pigsty. You know, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Joshua says, what have you done? And he knows that in five minutes they'll find it. He says, yes, I've sinned uh, against the Lord. And now, oh, brothers and sisters, hold on to your seats. Verse 24, it's judgment day. Can we see verse 24? Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the gold, the, the, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? Now, don't you think as he said that he would have pointed at the 36 graves? This is the trouble you've brought on us. All these men have died. Look at their widows and orphans. The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then, then all Israel stoned him. And after that, they stoned the rest. So this is terrible because of Achan's sin. His family die. Mm -hmm. so can you imagine Achan's son going daddy what has your sin done to me daddy what have you done daddy but that is what our sin does it destroys other people mm -hmm. and uh and it, it that you know it's such a brutal promise here now let me just finish with two questions number one why was Achan's sin so serious and the answer is because of, can you see chapter 7, verse 1? Chapter 7, verse 1. The Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Camry, Zimri, the son of Era, the son of Judah, took some of them. But do you see, it doesn't say Achan was unfaithful. This is what's a shock to us in our individualism. It says Israel was unfaithful. In other words, my sin affects you. And your sin affects me. Verse 11, they've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen, they've lied, they've put them with their own possessions. That's why they can't stand. So sin has a profound effect on the whole congregation. And so that God says, he doesn't say Achan has sinned, he says Israel has sinned. Now, brothers and sisters, let me tell you, in England, people cannot get their heads around this passage. They just can't believe that, that, they are in a group. They're so committed to their individualism. But what we're told here is that, is that and this runs right through scripture, is that, is that God, we're warned that if our home congregation harbor and tolerate and condone what Jesus hates, then he'll, he'll remove his lampstand from us. That's, that's from Revelation then, you know, I won't be with you anymore. Joshua 7 verse 12. So that's why church discipline is so important. And again, I'm an evangelist saying this, but, but we can't sweep things under the carpet. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit is removed. And, you know, in Thyatira, if you think about um, the letters to the churches in Revelation, it says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel and all her immoral practice. It's not that you do it, but you tolerate it. Ephesus, remember from where you've fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I'll remove my lampstand. So right through the Bible, we're told that actually my sin affects you, your sin affects me. And this has a critical effect on mission. Of course, what it means we have to ask ourselves is, and do jot this question down, please. That'd be great. Here's the question we jot down. What are you hiding from God in your home? What are, you, what are you hiding in your tent? Because your sin is never your business alone. It spills over into all of our lives. So please jot this word down. Sin has a contagious power. And therefore, what we need to do is feel more fear. If we're going to do better evangelism, we've got to begin by fearing sin in ourselves and our church families. Be sure your sin will find you out. Now, I, I worked with somebody who collapsed. They were on staff at my church. And brothers and sisters, they collapsed one day 
they went to hospital and it was found they were HIV positive and they were only released from hospital because they, the hospital said, you will not be released unless your flatmate knows about this. So to come out, they had to be told they're HIV positive. It then emerged that this person had been visiting massage parlors and brothels in their spare time. This was a, a, someone on staff at All Souls. And when we confronted them, they said, it's not your, it's nothing to do with you. What I do in my own time is up to me. That's what they said. But I remember thinking we're having such a terrible year evangelistically. So what we learn from that is that is that we've got to understand what Achan's covetousness, what his sin to the did to the church. Secondly, as we as we as we close, how do we get out of a situation in which we think we might be holding up the work of God? Of course, don't bluff God. Confess your sins. So we've got to have a culture of confession. Um, you know, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth isn't in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I, I, I've got to understand that although Achan was stoned for his sin, Jesus was stoned for mine. So amazingly, I don't have to bluff God and Jesus says, I'm going to die. But what I've got to do is be ruthless and kill the spider. And if I don't do that, it's not just me. It's the mission of the church that's at stake.